Well, hello world. My name is David Malin, and this is the last of CS50 seminars here at Harvard in fall of 2022. As you might know, we've been filming live the class again, and all of this past semester's lectures and now seminars will end up on edX and YouTube and other platforms on January 1st as part of what will be called CS50X 2023. In this particular seminar, I'm so excited that we're joined by Andrew Sellergren, an alum of Harvard who actually took CS50 the very first year I taught it for better or for worse. Uh, I think it's fair to say that surely everything he knows can be traced back to, to me, it would seem. But that's actually not the case, because if you read the description for today's talk on applications of artificial intelligence or AI in medicine, Andrew has been amazingly self-taught. In fact, when he was in college here, only took CS50, but then went on nonetheless to work for Google in various roles since. Only just a few years ago did he dive into and teach himself the world of machine learning, which he now applies to real-world problems in medicine that are so incredibly impactful that we're so glad that he's here today to share not only that same trajectory, but a little bit about what he now does at Google. So without further ado, here is CS50's own, and now Google's, Andrew Sellergren. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, David. Uh, that, was a, that was a really nice introduction. You, you said you would be funny, but I guess uh, you didn't come through on that. Um, <laughs> Um, no, I, I really, uh, I, I know he exaggerates, but uh, I, do, I do honestly trace a lot of, of this back to CS50 in particular. Um, uh, let me go ahead and start sharing and I'll kind of tell my story as well. Um, okay, awesome. Um, great, yeah, um, I'll, I'll start by, by welcoming everyone and um, thank you for joining. Uh, it's... Uh, really exciting to be here and it's really really cool to see all the faces from around the world uh, that's been uh, a real joy of mine to watch as the the course grew so as david mentioned i, I took the course for the first time i guess i, I should I, I am going to date our date us by saying this but it was 2007 uh, i was my it was my senior year in college and i was a pre-med i was getting ready to go to medical school and my last year at harvard i was taking courses that I, I wouldn't normally take just just for fun and CS50 was was one of them. I actually already knew David from a, um, a previous uh, venture and uh, was really excited that he was going to be teaching it. So um, you know it was it was everything I wanted in terms of getting me excited about a, a new uh, a, a new whole um, set of knowledge that I didn't have yet uh, and um, I wouldn't say, you know, there, there, there's not like a lightning strike there where all of a sudden I decided I wanted to be a software engineer. I, I, won't, I won't tell the story that way, but it was the beginning of, uh, of a lot of lifelong learning. And um, that's, that's the advice that I can give that uh, is probably best for anyone is that uh, as long as you are continuing to learn, challenge yourself, you're excited about what you're doing, uh, you don't necessarily need to concern yourself too much with uh, what that makes you, whether that makes you a software engineer or a scientist or uh, an artist or, or what have you, uh, it's really just about a skill set that you're that you're gathering, uh, and that's really what the start of it was with CS50. And I, I don't exaggerate when I say that uh, that was what gave me the com confidence to learn all these things. So CS50 is in large part about learning the fundamentals, uh, the very the the programming languages that you might begin with and some of the, the very foundational concepts of it, but it empowers you to learn anything you want after that. Uh, you, you can always trace back and say, well, I remember this concept from CS50 or yeah, I got stuck at this, this problem set, but then I worked my way through and uh, that's been invaluable. And uh, to be honest, I think it, uh, it continues to serve me even today. Uh, there's just there, there isn't anything that I try to limit myself and say, oh, I can't learn that, or oh, that's not what, what I'm supposed to be learning now. It's, it's really just something that I'm always challenging myself with, uh, and CS50 was a huge part of that to begin with. So um, the, the course itself has grown tremendously since then, which is also really exciting. Um, it, it, was, it was still really cool then, but it's, it's gotten a lot bigger. Um, oops, okay. 
So today I'm here to talk to you about what I currently do, which is uh, uh, AI for medical imaging, artificial intelligence for medical imaging, and a tool that we just released uh, along with a, some research that we did behind it called CXR Foundation, CXR for chest x-ray. Uh, and I'm a member of the Google Health AI team. Uh, so I do, I do promise I used to look like that. Uh, David, David can attest that I, I did look like that at some point, but uh, I guess I, uh, the pandemic hit, hit pretty hard. Um, so um, I'm a software engineer. Uh, a little bit more about my journey too was that uh, after college when I decided I didn't want to go to medical school, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I, I did end up teaching CS50 for a bit. I taught a few of the other courses that David offers. Uh, really enjoyed it, really used it as an opportunity to keep learning myself. Uh, and uh, then I applied for a job at Google as a technical analyst, which is some kind of um, data analyst for the ad traffic quality team. And uh, we were looking for uh, invalid ad, ad activity on the AdSense and AdWords networks. Uh, and that was also a great opportunity because I, I learned a lot of skills and, and there was a big push to scale yourself. So if you uh, wanted to have a bigger impact but, and you could write some scripts and some tools of your own that would uh, make you scale better, then, then that was a, a, a huge benefit. So that's where I also started learning more of my, my coding skills. And that was, that, that was the time when I decided, hey, I really like this uh, and, and I want to do this more frequently or I, I want this to be my core job. Um, so I transferred into software engineering in, in 2014. I uh, worked on the Google Fit app for a couple years, if you've, uh, if you've used that. Uh, then I, in 2017, I transferred to the Google Surveys team. Uh, both, in both of those teams, I worked a lot on infrastructure, so large-scale distributed systems, uh, getting data to flow from here to there, uh, kind of like plumbing. And uh, it, it was a fantastic experience, obviously, at Google because of the scale of the data that we were working with. Uh, and it also just hardened my, my skills in terms of writing good code, uh, writing good tests, and so on. And then in 2019, I decided that I wanted to uh, pivot back a little bit toward health and, and something that I knew was intrinsically meaningful to me. Uh, so I reached out to uh, the team working on uh, some of the, um, the health AI ventures at the time. Uh, I, I joined in an infrastructure role and I was working on some of the infrastructure there. I had no modeling experience, but I wanted to learn. So again, I just kind of picked it up, picked up, picked up the mantle and just said, okay, I'm going to learn this. Um, I took uh, Andrew Ng's uh, course on uh, machine learning from uh, Coursera and then just, just dove in and just really started modeling extensively. Um, and it's been three years. I would definitely not say I'm an expert, but I'm, I'm really excited with what I've learned. And the cool thing about the, uh, the AI field in general is that it's, it's advancing so rapidly that uh, not, pretty much no one can keep pace with it. So if you are trying to stay on the cutting edge of it, uh, you may be ahead of some other people who have studied a lot longer, but uh, haven't been keeping up with the, the state of the art. Um, so that's where we find ourselves now. Uh, and I'll, um, I would uh, also be remiss if I didn't uh, show my great team here, at least in one slide. Um, this, the, all, all, most of these are my co-authors on the paper. Um, they uh, uh, run the gamut from um, pure software engineers who work on machine learning theory to product managers uh, to uh, we have radiologists in there, we have clinicians, clinician scientists, research, research scientists, uh, and this isn't even all of our co-authors, these are just the ones at Google. We also collaborated with uh, a few different hospital systems, so it's really a huge team effort, and that also hopefully gives you inspiration that uh, you don't have to be a pure software engineer to, to uh, contribute to things like this, and, and I'll get into how valuable they were in each of their different roles, and and why it's important to, to come together in this inter, interdisciplinary way, uh, because uh, you don't get great results without that kind of, uh, of teamwork. Um, so uh, you, you, you may know some of our, uh, our work on Google in terms of AI, and uh, it was uh, not too many years ago that Sundar 
put out a um, a missive basically saying that we would put we would we would focus on AI first in a lot of things. Um, so uh, Google has tremendous research experience in this area, and we can use this AI to improve experience in core Google products like. Uh, Google Photos, Google Translate. So you may have used uh, uh, photos where you can search for personal photos with tags, or you can even search for objects. You can search for a bike or a banana, and and it will it will find it. And then the Google Translate uh, functionality is something I've I've used myself, where you can uh, read a menu in a different language um, in real time. It's it's uh, fantastic, um, and we're also using AI to tackle hard problems in the physical world. So uh, Waymo is, is taking on computer vision in the realm of self-driving. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about computer vision and AI, uh, and it's not too dissimilar from, from what they're doing there as well. Uh, and with Google Health and AI, uh, our mission is really to show what's possible and bring these benefits of AI to everyone. Uh, so we do conduct research that advances the state of the art in the field, and we're applying AI to uh, new products, new domains. Um, uh, but our w one of our larger goals is to make sure that everyone can access that, that AI. And that's that's what I want to talk to you about today and why I tried to, to reiterate that no experience is necessary. That I think um, if some of the, the topics we talk about today m may uh, catch you off guard, then you can always go back, study a little bit, come back to this. Um, but the, the goal is to kind of uh, bring that to everyone, both in terms of resources and, and in terms of knowledge. Um, so uh, a few of the examples here, you see there's some work doing we're doing on on device with Coral. Uh, there's the um, brain uh, mapping, there's uh, uh, colonoscopies and uh, prediction of um, uh, sleep patterns. So all of these things are uh, in our wheelhouse. Um, okay, so uh, before we get started, uh, I, I know that a lot of you also don't have experience with uh, artificial intelligence or with, with ML machine learning in general. So I wanted to give a very quick intro to neural networks, which is the type of machine learning and artificial intelligence we'll be talking about today. Uh, However, uh, I want to give a big shout out to Brian Yu and to point you all to that course because um, I, uh, I, I went through a little bit of the contact and content so far and it's fantastic. Um, I'm going to be borrowing a few of his slides from his lecture on neural networks, um, but it's a great way to bootstrap yourself in terms of, of learning uh, what ML and what AI can do. So, but let's just talk. Let's just talk about neural networks for a mi minute. Uh, here we have a, a an illustration of a neuron. Um, so these are the the fundamental building block of your brain, um, and uh, these neurons are connected to each other and they receive electrical signals from other neurons. Um, so uh, there's two important parts there. Basically, one is that uh, they communicate with each other. So there's billions and billions in your brain. Uh, they process input sig signals, and then they have this notion of being activated. Um, so that in, in the in the brain, that corresponds to an electrical signal. Uh, but um, we'll talk about it in the context of an artificial neural network in a second. So here you have a, a two neurons that are communicating via this synapse, uh, and that's some kind of electrical signal that's going between them. And together, the two of them plus billions of others may combine to do much more complex calculations. So that's uh, an oversimplification, but it's a, it's a useful one. Um, so when we talk about artificial neural networks, uh, we're talking about a mathematical model for learning that's inspired by these biological neural networks. Um, so it's, it, uh, you can think of it as just one large math equation, right? It takes inputs on one end and, and gives outputs on the other. Um, and this is based on the structure and the parameters of the network. Um, so these neurons, let me uh, go forward for a second. This, this neuron, this biological neuron, you can report place with just this, we'll have a, a circle here, you know, a, a single building block for this large neural network. Uh, and if we want to do more complex things, uh, we can connect them together uh, and connect many, 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 many together, right? Um, so the, let's go back for a second to here. So, the other aspect of this uh, neural network that is important to note and will be uh, good for our sake 
um, is that they can they can learn. So we start them with basically uh, completely random. Uh, they have they have no knowledge, um, but through a process which I think uh, I can point you again to Brian Yu's course through a, a process called back propagation. Um, we give it the outputs and then we let it look back on its on all of its parameters and say, okay, how can I um, how can I tweak these so that I predict those outputs a little bit better? Um, and that is the, that's the magic that makes these neural networks work. Um, uh, these parameters are, are basically, uh, you may hear them called weights, um, but they essentially are coefficients in a very large math equation. Um, so if you were to write that out end to end, um, you would be able to put in your inputs um, and then you would get your outputs just like you do in a, an, in a equation like y equals mx plus b, um, except it's many, many millions or billions of these neurons. Um, okay, so um, what, what do we use this for? So uh, Brian also uh, uh, put together this, these nice slides about uh, classification problems. So a lot of the uh, problems that we face in machine learning and in, in health for machine learning are classification problems. That just means that we're trying to say something is of one class or another, um, in this case, red or blue. Um, in, in health, it might be um, uh, diseases present or diseases not present. Um, so with this distribution of data that you see here, it's fairly obvious uh, that we could design a classifier just by drawing a line between the red and the blue. Um, so in our, our neural network then, it would be very simple, it would just be a line. Um, and it, it's a nice visual representation of how we can separate that data. And so you, then you say anything below the line is blue, anything above the line is red, uh, and we go from there. Um, what about a more complex set of uh, data like this? Um, so obviously we as humans can very quickly draw a circle around the red in there. That's actually a little bit more complicated for, for writing a, uh, an equation, a math equation for this. Um, one thing that I'll mention here that you may hear in other uh, lectures on this, this topic is that these neural networks are nonlinear. So that's a huge uh, advantage to them to be able to learn not just linear relationships, but have these um, so-called activation functions, which are nonlinear, and they allow it to learn things like this, which are a little bit more complicated in their nature. Um, so uh, we'll put a pin in this for now because I want to. I, I will actually show you much more complex data that can be even reduced to something that looks like this. Um, but very, very briefly and very um, broadly speaking, our our problem is no no different than this. We're trying to separate the red dots out from the blue dots. Um, uh, you may have a more complex, you know, maybe there's more than two colors. There's green, there's yellow, et cetera, but uh, it's, it's fundamentally the same problem. Um, I guess actually this would be a good time to pause for, for questions if there are any or... Um, I should just mention that we yeah we have plenty of time um, and uh, I I will be going fairly quickly. This will be a, a, a big survey through not just uh, ML and AI but um, medical imaging as well. Uh, so please don't hesitate to stop me. Um, and uh, mostly I want to show you what's capable. You know what 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 we can do with this um, and to get you excited about the field. Um, so. Uh, Okay, so, so let's now talk about um, AI development for medical imaging. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the big focus of uh, Google uh, and Google Health AI is to reduce barriers to AI development. Um, so for us to have impact, we want more people to be involved. We see ourselves as an enabler. Uh, that means um, both, as I said, in terms of resources, uh, as well as knowledge and skills. So. Uh, we're very well aware that Google has resources for modeling that m most other places don't. Um, that comes in the form of uh, um, accelerators for the actual modeling as well as data. Um, and we, we want to share, share that with the world. We want to share the benefits of that with the world. And similarly, the, uh, the knowledge and the skill set. So 
uh, we're very lucky to to have the the best in the world that we we can work with but um, we want to make this a little bit more accessible to to those who are just getting started um, so today we're going to talk uh, uh, the the use case or the case study that I'm going to look at first is chest x-rays um, and that's that's my main uh, focus um, but it's really just an a, a, an example of um, what could be what could be possible, and uh, this could apply to many different modalities like um, CT imaging, uh, MRI, ultrasound, um, uh, pathology slides. Uh, you know, even just uh, natural images from a camera for things like your um, skin conditions. Um, so, uh, some of the principles, or most of the principles, are are pretty applicable uh, through everything. Okay, so. Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, I do see some questions. Okay. Um, does yeah, this Andrew, I, I've been jotting down some questions as we go. I can weave them in when it okay, feels okay. timely. Yeah, I think it's a good good time to pause anyway. Okay. Does this? Uh, Fred says, does this mean that in the future radiologists will not be human? Um, I don't know if I would go that far. I think, uh, and this will be clear from some of how I describe our collaborations later, but. Uh, I think the the future is really a combination of the two. Uh, we we get our best results when we work collaboratively collaboratively with radiologists. Um, they lend their knowledge to us, and then we lend extra tools to them. And we really want to understand the problem from their perspective. And uh, from there, we may design a tool that works well with their workflow. Um, but we we are not. Uh, we're not intending to replace it. We, we don't think that it's, um, that's the best path forward at the moment. Um, we, but we do want to help save them time and help bridge that gap for uh, a short supply. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll have some, uh, as far as resources, we'll definitely have some more, uh, some links that I can provide you and, and we, can pr we can send out that would uh, get you started in, in this field um, of machine learning and in health AI. Um, with how much precision can medical AI identify disease, e.g. cancer cells? Um, it's a good question. I think uh, um, it's getting more and more precise every day. So, uh, and it's, it's maybe scaling even exponentially. Um, so uh, there, we have a team, for example, that works um, uh, the our gen genomics or genetics team that works on deep variant and um, deep consensus, and those are things that enable you to do virtually real time uh, sequencing of of um, either disease or or the the person. Um, and uh, that helps with a precision treatment or the availability of a treatment. Um, the, the precision medicine on, on the scale of, say, pathology slides or uh, uh, radiology images, um, those are getting more and more real time. Um, obviously, they're getting larger, but then they're still able to run particularly fast. Um, so it's, uh, it's an exciting time um, to, to see how, how far we can push the field. Um, um, instead of predictions, what time, type of AI would you run for decision making in health? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know, you know, my, my field is not necessarily in the um, NLP or the natural language processing or conversational AI, but uh, obviously that, that field is advancing rapidly as well. Um, and I think the ability to add reasoning to, um, to some of these uh, AI tools is super compelling. Um, and I think it's, it's going to get better. Uh, I think um, there, there are some data sets like medical question answering uh, data sets where, we're, where you, you test its ability to sort of reason. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I think that's, that's still where humans shine uh, in large part, but um, it's getting better every day. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, are there models not based in biological um, brains? Um, yes, I mean, I think um, I would actually argue that the uh, if, if you want to dig deep into it and go down a bit of a rabbit hole, uh, the the models don't really perfectly mimic uh, biological brains. Um, uh, I think we learn more about 
how they complement each other or how they mimic each other every day. Um, but it's a bit of an over, oversimplification. Uh, I would also argue that your brain is far, far, far more powerful than the neural networks that we're training. Um, so it's a pretty, that's a pretty cool thing to learn when you maybe come into this field thinking the opposite that, uh, oh, machines are much better. Um, they may be, they may be better at certain tasks, but, but we, we are much better generalists. Um, and there's no better example of that than my daughter who, uh, watching her learn is, is, uh, amazing because, uh, you know, she may not have even seen something before, but she already has a, a knowledge of how to interact with it. Um, and uh, that's, that's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. Um, did Google perform research on EEG, EKG, EMG? Um, I think we do have some research there. I'm not, I'm not sure of the current published status of it, but um, uh, yeah, okay. So um, let's see. Andrew, I can take notes on some of the questions and weave them back in if some of these you'll touch on anyway. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's the, wow, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, we will do our best. Let's, I guess we'll move forward and maybe, maybe you can weave some more in as we go. That sounds sure. good. Okay. Um, so um, going back to, to AI for medical imaging, and as I mentioned, we're going to use chest x-ray here as a, uh, as a case study, uh, but a lot of this is going to apply to other modalities, all kinds of medical imaging. So why chest x-ray? Uh, well, um, chest x-rays are uh, ubiquitous. They're, they're highly accessible, highly available. There's about a billion taken around the world uh, every year. Um, and uh, they're very inexpensive. They're also non-invasive, meaning you know they're not um, requiring surgery or something like that. Um, they have a fairly low uh, radiation dose, I believe, as well. Um, so it's uh, it's a great modality for that. Um, it's uh, also used for a very long tail of rare conditions. So um, we'll look today f uh, at five or 10 that are fairly common and that are kind of um, standard ones that you may see on a lot of chest x-rays, but there's a huge long tail. There's a lo lot of rare conditions, which um, makes chest x-ray very useful, but it's also very difficult then to, um, to interpret them. Um, and that's where the radiologists shine on the, the human side of things. Um, but but that, that high quality interpretation is uh, difficult um, to, to, to do and to, um, to train for, um, uh, doubly so for training a model to do that. Um, so that's where, uh, this work that we'll talk about, uh, will, sh will shine. Um, so there's also a short supply of radiologists. Um, uh, there are definitely areas of the world where there's, there's far fewer available than there are images taken. Um, and there's also variability between the, uh, the experts and the sites. So you may have different uh, imaging equipment. You may have different um, uh, interpretations of the same image. Um, so uh, these, are all, these are all challenges. And then as I mentioned uh, with, with Google and where, where Google's uh, um, forte is, is in building these very, very large models. So, um, they require very large curated data sets. Um, so for our purposes, for this model, we're talking about, it was about a million chest x-rays, which even on the scale of machine learning is pretty small. Uh, a lot of the uh, natural language uh, processing ML that you see today may have been trained on multi-billion um, or web scale uh, data sets. Um, whereas, you know, a million chest x-rays is a very large medical data set, but it's a small um, data set for natural images. But for anyone to have a million chest x-rays is, is, uh, is pretty difficult. Um, and it also requires extensive fine tuning. So uh, some of the, the very specific models that we developed, like our tuberculosis model, uh, they require 6, 12, 24 months of software engineering time. And that's a whole... Uh, team of people working on it, trying different things, um, going back to the drawing board. Um, we call this fine tuning. Um, and uh, it's not something that everyone can replicate. So this is where, again, once we've done this um, in one, one use case, how can we uh, help generalize it and um, let it uh, benefit everyone and, and a bunch of other tasks? 
Um, so let's let's uh, we can play a little game here um, if people want to um, be interactive. Um, uh, okay, so how challenging is this task? Um, and not just for for machines, but for humans. Um, uh, I wanted to show a few examples of chest X-rays. You can you can Google around for things like these. Um, but um, here here's one. Um, can anyone uh, spot the abnormality here? Okay, I see one one person saying uh, pneumonia. Anyone else have any any guesses? Uh, right chest smaller. Uh, left upper lobe. Actually, yeah, I would say left upper lobe is is pretty close. So I'll give that uh, give that credit. So there's a nodule here which you can see is very, very difficult to see. Um, the, a nodule is a small uh, mass of tissue in the lung. In, the case, in this case, it's less than three centimeters. Um, and it can be benign or malignant. So uh, it may or may not be even noted on a radiology report. Um, it, it could be something that they decide to biopsy and, and figure out if it's benign or, or malignant. Um, but as you can see, it's not super easy to uh, to catch, um, and so training an, an AI classifier to do it is is non-trivial. Okay, how about uh, this one? Anyone can can spot the abnormality? Oh, wow! Uh, salt has got it. Uh, pneumothorax. Yes. So, um, so on the right here, you have what looks, in some ways, like more normal. Um, it's it's a black space on the chest x-ray, but this is actually a collapsed lung. Um, so air has leaked into the space between the lung and the chest wall, um, and this would require intubation. Um, and uh, um, it's, a, it's a very serious uh, issue. Um, I'll pause here just to note uh, uh, one thing about uh, you know these chest x-rays. So when we're talking here, we're talking about frontal chest x-rays. There's two different ways to take those. There's um, AP, antero-posterior, and um, PA, um, postero-anterior. Um, so this is whether the, the um, x-ray machine comes from uh, above or below. Um, and there's some interesting uh, implications for that, uh, that um, when uh, patients are uh, sicker, um, they tend to have one type because they, they're laying down and they may not be able to have an x-ray standing up. Um, so uh, they... Uh, this is actually something that confounds our ability to classify. Um, it may just learn the type, the orientation of the image as opposed to uh, the actual diagnosis. Um, similarly here with the pneumothorax, um, this one is untreated so far, so it, there's no intubation, whereas uh, pneumothorax would normally require um, uh, uh, intubation and, and, um, and immediate treatment. So then when you take the chest x-ray, uh, anyone who has pneumothorax is going to already have um, some lines and tubes, which make it very easy for the AI to learn, well, as long as there's lines and tubes, then I know it's a pneumothorax. So that's a, um, uh, a big problem. Um, I think I saw a hand raised, uh, but... There is a question in the chat. Mila is asking Andrew, is this the same person? And what about their age group? Uh, no, this is not the same person as the as the nodule one. No, it's not. You can sell. You can see there's a you know pretty big difference in their anatomy. Um, I have the uh, the citation here below, so you should be able to look that up. I'm not sure about the age group of of them. Um, okay, so um, this one I'm not even going to ask you to try because it's very very difficult. But it was my example of. Uh, of a very, very difficult case that may not be easy to catch. So down there in the, in the bottom right of our screen, but on their left um, is a rib fracture. Um, so this is the type of thing that could very easily be missed. Um, and it's also very hard for, uh, for AI to pick up on. Um, so it, it, uh, it exemplifies some of the challenges we face here. Um, uh, oh, here's a question I can address really quickly. Would you re recommend any specific deep learning structure to the task? Is vision transformer a good choice? Um, I'll try not to go too much down the rabbit hole here because it's a very interesting time. Um, 
the type of model that we've trained here is something called a convolutional neural network. Um, so again, I'll point you to Brian's uh, amazing course, which talks about convolutions. Um, convolutions are, you can think of as a filter for the image. Um, so it will progress uh, through the image and, and in some ways sort of um, compress it to that end. Um, and this has been the standard since about 2012, for vision anyway, um, for a number of reasons. Convolutional neural networks have uh, built in um, what they call um, translation invariance. So uh, it uh, doesn't matter where in the image um, that, it's, uh, that it's happening. Um, it can um, pick it up. Uh, uh, and it, it, that, that's a huge advantage for something like uh, vision tasks. Um, that being said, so, so they've been this, the go-to for, for 10 or more years at this point for, um, so only recently in the last two years, um, vision transformers have emerged. Um, transformer is an, is another type of architecture that is been, has been used heavily in natural language processing. Um, and, uh, this just works in a little bit of a different way. It doesn't have some of the same, what we call inductive biases. Um, as the convolutional neural networks. Um, but it also has advantages um, like its ability to, um, uh, using a method called attention, it can basically look at the whole image um, and, it, and it correlates every, every block of the image with every other block of the image, um, which is a, a big advantage. However, um, they require a lot more data in the, in the case of vision in order to Kind of bootstrap themselves and get get used to the task so um they've definitely proven very uh performant on some of the natural language i'm uh, sorry natural image tasks um they are starting to prove even even better for the medical image tasks um i've tried them on some of the same tasks that i'll show here and i got slightly worse results than i did for my convolutional neural networks that doesn't mean they are worse or that they always will be that way. It could just be a matter of I didn't um, uh, tune them properly, but um, the uh, um, that, re that remains to be seen. Um, okay, so is there a nodule on the right lobe here? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I don't think so. If you're talking about this, I don't think, I think that's maybe an artifact of the, um, the image, but I could be wrong. I'm also not a radiologist, I am doing uh, uh, my best impression here, but okay. So, um, this last one, um, we'll see if, uh, we can spot the ab abnormality here. Anyone? Yeah, I'll give, I'll go ahead and give that, to, um, I hope I'm saying this Mila or Mila, uh, pneumonia. Um, yeah, so this one is, um, COVID-19. Uh, so uh, they refer to it technically as peripheral and lower lobe predominant rounded airspace opacities, but um, for the most part that will amount to uh, uh, pneumonia in the, the bottom parts of these lungs. Um, so uh, this this will, this will is an important motivator for some of the, the tasks that we're going to look at for our model here. Um, and it's just a reminder of um, of what chest x-rays can do. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, our mission is really to enable others to train better custom chest x-ray models. Um, we know that, uh, that other outfits don't have the same data, the same setup, the same computational power. Um, so our mission is to advance science and, and deliver impact. Um, and we define impact as being uh, the end result, um, you know, actual clinical um, effects um, and some in, in most cases those are going to be uh, taken care of or affected by others not by Google directly um, and that's that's what we're looking to do here with our ability to to train these models so this is a threefold problem um, we want to decrease the training time for these models uh, we want to improve their label efficiency that means we just want to be able to use fewer images to do the same tasks so as opposed to having the hundreds of thousands or uh, millions of images, can we do it with a thousand, a hundred, ten images? Um, reducing model complexity. So the convolutional neural networks that we trained here 
are on the order of um, some of them as large as 500 million or even a billion uh, parameters, uh, a billion weights. Um, and um, those are massive. We're also talking about huge uh, high resolution images. Um, original chest x-rays are somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 4, pixels. Um, a lot of the literature will downsample them all the way to 224 by 224. Uh, we, with our resources, we're able to train on uh, images that are size 1024 by 1024. Um, so that's a, another big advantage. Um, uh, so, so what is our method here in order to try to affect this third party impact that I mentioned? Um, what we want to do is just basically do as much as possible on Google's side as, as we can uh, before we, we hand off something resembling a model or something resembling the, the training. Um, to the third party, so to the person who might actually be doing the end training. So um, there, there's a fair amount of text on here, but let's just let's just break it down um, fairly simply. So uh, going back here, when I mentioned, oops. So uh, this this is a rough uh, diagram of a neural network, um, and you can see. Uh, we're, we're probably looking at moving left to right, uh, which is through these neurons. Um, um, but you can see, if let's say you were to turn it on its um, on its side, it, it resembles something like a pyramid. Um, the way that we're envisioning this here, and, and a useful uh, analogy here, is to think of it as a pyramid. So on the bottom, we have our chest X-ray image, which we we feed into the model as pixels, just as numerical values, um, uh, and um, we slowly hone in on our classification. So the actual output of the model is going to be just one number generally. Um, that'll be a number probably between zero and one that represents um, our prediction. Um, so usually it would be something like if it's closer to one, um, then we are predicting that the, the disease is there or the condition is there. And if it's zero, um, it's uh, not there. Um, so here within our pyramid, um, these layers in here are our artificial neurons. Um, so we have many, 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 many layers of them. And again, millions, billions of them in there. Somewhere in there, toward the top of it, uh, we have a layer that is not quite the end result, um, but it has a lot of what we call features. So um, these are these are still just floating point numbers. Um, and we, we, we don't we can't exactly point to one thing that they represent, but they are useful for the diagnosis. Um, so they're not quite as interpretable as say, you know, oh, this uh, this is a you know left lung and this is a right lung. Um, but you can you can think of it as uh, something resembling that. And we're going to call this the embedding. Um, this is uh, in our case, an embedding is really just a a string of numbers. It's it's um, maybe a thousand, 1300, 2000 numbers in a row. And these are our features for the chest X-ray. So um, another useful way of thinking about it is this is just a very fancy image compression algorithm. Um, so uh, we put in a chest X-ray image, which is 3000 by 4000 pixels. And what we got out of it was a thousand numbers. Um, so just like you might compress a, uh, a an audio file or a video file uh, on your computer. This is sort of a compression of that uh, in a way that we're trying to retain as much of the useful information as possible. Um, so uh, let's let's take that definition of, of embedding and go forward from here. Okay, so what was our technique here? Um, it's it's pretty much as, as simple as it sounds. So um, I don't wanna overcomplicate this and make it sound like it was too, too fancy. Um, what we have is what we call a CXR pre-trained network, a chest x-ray pre-trained network. Uh, so in a typical setup for machine learning, we, you often do what's called transfer learning, uh, which means that you take a model that was trained on one task and you try to train it on another. Um, you fine tune it on another task um, by exposing it to new data. Um, and generally that, that is a, an advantage that, that tends to get better results. Um, the, the, story the, the the truth of it for medical imaging is that may not be all that useful so 
uh, the state of the art in all kinds of uh, machine learning and computer vision out there is usually done on a data set called ImageNet, which is, uh, I think, 14 million natural images um, of a thousand different classes. And um, everyone competes to get the best score on this. Um, then we, what we do on, uh, in medical imaging is we usually take a model trained on those and then we, we expose it to medical images. Um, and we get good results, but the question is, did, do we get better results than if we just started from nothing? And um, I think that the jury is still out on that actually, because it may speed up the time it takes for us to train it, um, but I'm not sure that the end result is a better model. Um, so what we're proposing here is basically kind of um, adding in another step where we train things on more specific data for your tasks. So um, we have the ability to train it on a million chest x-rays. So then when you take your model, it will already know what a chest x-ray is. Uh, it will um, have some, some way of reasoning about that. So then on the right side, we're gonna take this pre-trained network, which we're using to generate these embeddings um, and then we can do a bunch of different things. So the typical setup is on the bottom right, uh, there's a uh, task specific network and we can fine tune the whole network. Um, so uh, this, is, this is usually going to get the best performance, but there's a few concerns here in our case. One is that we trained on private data um, from a few different data sets and we don't want to expose uh, that data in any way to uh, the outside world. So releasing the model may, may uh, be a risk in that sense. Um, so what can we do instead? Well, we are able actually to just expose the model as an API. So you can, you can um, call, your, call this model with your images and you get back embeddings. Um, and then from there, in these, these strategy one and two, you can see you can actually train a very small model on that um, and get decent results in any case. Um, so the way we were visualizing this is, is again, um, hopefully very uh, instructive. If this is the pyramid, uh, we're sort of just chopping off the, the, the head of the pyramid and then we're asking you to fill, to, to, to fill in um, the space. So. Um, as opposed to having to build the whole pyramid yourself. So this is where, where this, this really cool animation comes from. On the left, you can see uh, the traditional approach is to, to build a pyramid for each different task. So you have to start all the way from scratch or from image, ImageNet, and it's gonna take time. Um, on the right, we gave you a pyramid with the, the head chopped off, and you can just add your own different heads um, that represent different tasks. Uh, and we, what we found is that this, this approach, you get really good results even without having started from the very beginning. Um, okay, so um, I'll very quickly talk about uh, the, this is, a, this is the more highly technical side of things, but this is the type of learning that we did for this. So in, when you start your machine learning, uh, education, you, you, you'll probably learn a lot about cross entropy loss, which is kind of the typical um, task or, or objective for um, classification problems. Um, but there's a lot of other options out there. Um, uh, some of them are contrastive learning. Um, and this is just what it sounds like. So uh, you're taking two, two images and you're comparing them to each other. And then you're giving the, the model some information about what those two images represent. Um, so in this case, uh, or in the, the images we have here, what we're doing is we're telling the model that these two images are both of a dog. Um, and so we, wanna, um, we want to, you to learn some representation, some embedding of this image that brings those two, two things together. And then we want to push all the cats away. Um, so uh, this is the same for our medical imaging task. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to say that these two images are abnormal. So that means that they, and as you saw on the previous slides, maybe they have a pneumothorax, maybe they have a nodule, uh, maybe they have a fracture, they're abnormal. So put them together in our embedding space um, and then push away any ones that are normal. So anything where a chest X-ray doesn't have anything that requires follow-up or, or is of note. 
Um, so the nice thing about this is that uh, the most of our radiology classification tasks can be reformulated in this way. So uh, you can imagine that if you could identify a chest X-ray as normal, then we're kind of done with it. You can the decision tree is basically you know you you move on. But the abnormals is where we want to start uh, separating things out. Um, what's interesting about the loss, and this is a perfect example of why I love this field, is because um, even doing something like this, we get separation of the abnormal images. They, they get separated from each other to some extent. So the fractures get separated from the pneumothorax. Um, and I'm not really sure why. <laughs> um, it's, it's something that we want to actively consider. But... Here's a visualization of that. So if you remember, I, I pointed earlier to this red and blue and how prescient that would be um, for our classification problem. So here we're using a visualization technique called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, or T-SNE. Um, and this is just a very fancy uh, name for a, a way of taking our long vector, our, our array of a thousand um, floats, and then we're compressing it, we're, we're projecting it down onto um, two numbers, right? Two axes, X and Y, so that we can visualize it. So it's definitely an oversimplification, but it helps us as humans reason about it a little bit, right? So what we're seeing here is that on the left, um, if we take a model that was trained on ImageNet and we do this technique, um, you can see that there's not really very good separation. Um, it would be very hard for you as a human to draw a circle around just the blue dots that excludes the red dots. Um, and just the same for a machine, it would be very hard to do that. On the right, um, it's a little bit easier. It's not perfect, but you can see, you could imagine drawing a little, a little circle around the blue, and that's a separation from the red. Um, and this on the right is our chest X-ray network. So you can see that even without having done any work, we have a pretty good separation. We already have a pretty good way of classifying this airspace opacity class. Um, so that's a pretty cool result. Um, and um, I'll, I'll say here very quickly, um, just to talk a little bit about the metrics. Um, what we're visualizing here or what we're graphing here is something called AUC, area under the curve. Um, so uh, actually more on that in a minute, um, I will say that what this what's what we're showing here is that we're able to get basically the same performance um, as some of these uh, these pre-trained networks that are fine-tuned on the task at hand. Um, our our model with a small layer tra trained on top is the red, so you can see it's um, best in show um, up to. Um, an order of magnitude around 10,000 images. Um, so um, only there, if you have more than 10,000 images, do you start to get an advantage from training on all of them and training a large network on them. Otherwise, you may be better off doing um, our simple approach, which is much faster. Um, and in the case of two uh, really uh, uh, vital diagnoses here, uh, tuberculosis and COVID-19, um, we get better results when we use our, smart, our small models, and that's because we have so few images. Um, so I'll, I'll um, bring up this slide so we can talk about um, some of the metrics, as I mentioned. So here we have AUC is on the left, um, and that's area under the curve. Um, so what is that curve? Here is that curve. It's called the receiver operating uh, characteristic curve. So it represents the trade-off between finding true positives uh, and false positives. Um, so uh, once you have your number in a, in a classification model that's between zero and one, you have to decide what is your so-called operating point. So that's the, that's the threshold at which you say, okay, above this is positive, below this is negative. Um, and that's a whole, um, whole can of worms to try to figure out your operating point. Uh, you, you know, you might think, okay, let's just start with 0.5. Well, most of the time it's not perfectly well distributed. Um, so maybe 0.8 or 0.7. Um, so you have a choice to make as to where to pick that operating point to kind of get the best trade off. So in some cases you may want to have, um, you may want to optimize for more 
true positives and um, and uh, or a higher true positive rate and uh, uh, than a, a false positive rate or a lower lower false positive rate. So this graph, this receiver operating characteristic curve, just represents the trade off between these two. So everywhere along this line is a possible operating point that you can pick. Um, and each one is going to have, again, different trade-offs. So when we talk about what's, what scores we're giving our model, we're, we actually just go ahead and add up all the area under this curve. So the, the better this curve is, the more up and to the left it is, right? So um, this AUC here is on the order of 0 0.9, 0 0.92, 0 0.95. You can see most of the graph is underneath the curve. Um, and that's a, oops, that's a good thing. Um, and also here we have we have um, graphed a few different radiologists. So this is this is from having them review the same images. We can show that our performance is at least as good at, as them um, because they fall somewhere on the curve or below the curve generally. Um, but what's fascinating about this is that here we've trained on only a hundred images. Um, we trained a very simple model that took five minutes and um, the the train and the test sets are from different countries so uh, another uh, common practice in machine learning is to to train on certain images and then you hold out some images so that uh, you can be sure that you are testing on something sort of fair so in this case our images came from our training images came from the u.s and our test images came from China. Um, so we can be sure that it does pretty well even um, if we're using different um, demographics, um, different imaging uh, equipment. Um, so that's a really good result. Uh, and then here um, we have even more RUC, ROC curves um, and we trained a model on COVID-19 severity. So our ability to predict whether a um, COVID-19 patient would need to be ventilated or um, go into the ICU. Um, the, again, the interesting thing here is we only have uh, 500 images. So I'll pause here again to talk quickly about the, um, some of how this research came to be. Uh, in March of 2020, we were looking at developing a, an abnormal normal model. Um, so as I mentioned, this ability to separate abnormal chest x-rays from, from normal chest x-rays. Uh, and then when the pandemic hit, we wondered, could we do something with this model to help uh, help with the the scarcity of testing that was available at that time. Um, uh, we talked to our partners uh, at Northwestern and we found that they had about 500 images. And it was March of 2020, so it was very new. Um, they didn't have a lot of uh, images. Um, so what can we do with that few images? Well, that's where we started to look at this, these very um, low label, low number of images um, case studies. Um, so the result that we showed was that, yes, you can actually predict some of this stuff with chest x-ray. But I'll also, I also want to highlight that um, this conversation, we, we did not um, put anything out there because we, having spoken to our radiologists, our clinicians on staff, um, the, the determination was basically that um, this is not a part of a normal clinical workflow. So even though you could diagnose COVID-19 from a chest x-ray, um, it would be a strange thing to have people come in who had symptoms of COVID and then take a chest x-ray of them and then diagnose them. Um, that's not typically what would happen. And so it wasn't super useful off the bat. However, it was a great um, way of demonstrating that we are able to train these models that can very quickly adapt. Um, and that continues to be true even today because the landscape of COVID-19 is always changing, more so than anything we've ever seen before. So now we have patient populations that are changing in terms of um, uh, the, the vaccine rates, um, the, their, their demographics for who's being affected, the different variants. Um, so all of these things are things that are going to challenge our model. But if we're able to quickly adapt with a, a small number of images like this, um, then we're well suited. Okay, so um, I'm almost to the good stuff. Um, I, I will say one other thing just to set up the, um, so another type of, so I mentioned earlier this, this idea of contrastive losses and we're taking two images and bringing them together. Another cool thing that you can do is take not two images, but one image and one piece of text and bring them together. Um, and you tell the model, these are similar. 
um, even though they're different, you know, one of them is an image, one of them is text, um, you can bring them together in this embedding space. Um, so this was developed um, originally for the clip paper, but it's now been applied to chest x-rays with um, the convert and check zero. Um, and that we'll, we'll just hold that thought for now because um, it will become important in a minute. Um, so what can we do with these embeddings? Um, we can do a few things and I'm going to do, help you do all of these right now. So um, let's get to it. A zero shot image classifier. What does that mean? Well, zero shot means that um, the model has not seen anything uh, or has not been given a label of something before. So uh, it, it, you could imagine training something on, on uh, fracture and then you ask it, um, uh, Where's the pneumothorax? Um, that would be an example of a zero shot. And it's a very difficult problem, obviously, because um, machine learning models benefit from uh, having seen labeled images beforehand. Um, so what if you don't have that? Well, um, this, is, this is what we'll look at here. Um, another case is text to image retrieval. So what if you wanted to look up images based on the text that you input? So this is what I'm demonstrating here on the right and what we'll build. Uh, what if you wanted to build a, a radiology report generator? Um, we can do that too. Um, and I, I want to pause here also to really um, thank the folks that put together these two large open source um, data sets. Um, uh, Mimic CXR, it comes out of MIT. Chexpert comes out of Stanford. Um, and uh, they're, they're really, really useful for developing these kinds of, of models. Um, so let me go ahead and... Um, switch to collab so we can get some cool demos going here. Um, I have taken more time than I expected. David, do you have any um, questions you want to want to feed in right now? No, I think folks are probably about to really enjoy the hands-on part, so we should forge ahead. OK, sounds good. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar, this is collab. Um, it's a it's based on Jupyter, which is also um, available. And it's basically just a playground for you to run Python code um, uh, locally, or you can have a, it connected to a runtime that's that's hosted in the cloud. Um, so uh, I will make some version of this code available. Um, I need to clean it up because it's embarrassing right now, but um, it will uh, uh, serve its purposes now. So um, here, there's just some instructions for setting this up to run locally. Um, and uh, I will, I've also prefabbed some of this. So here we're just gonna go ahead and import a bunch of libraries that we need. Uh, a few of them are TensorFlow, sklearn, pandas. Um, a lot of them are very common data science libraries. Um, CXR Foundation is the name of our tool that we released and is a library on GitHub and on um, PIP. PIP is our library uh, um, dependency management system. Um, so I've already installed this. It also includes a bunch, has a bunch of dependencies, so it takes a little longer to install. Um, okay, so now um, I'm connected to my local uh, local machine here, um, and I'm just going to go into this folder uh, for Mimic CXR. Um, this this step unfortunately takes a little bit too long, but what I'm doing here is just reading in the radiology reports because we're going to use those as um, inputs to our model, um, and here. Um, we're also going to take the radiology reports and we're going to just clip into a section of them called the impression section. So that's usually some kind of a summary that the, the radiologist has given that um, is less detailed but more focused and will be good for our training. Um, so here I've also just again done some more, um, some more pre-processing of this, um, but let's, I'll, I'll show you what this looks like in a minute. Um, Okay, so let's examine our embeddings. Um, so as I mentioned, um, these are just uh, arrays of numbers. So to prove that point, here's, here's one of them. So um, these range in value, I don't know that they have a min and a max. Um, you can normalize them and so on, but they could be negative, they could be positive. There's about a thousand of them in our particular model. Um, and believe it or not, they contain all of the information that we need. Um, okay, so here, uh, I have my labels file. So for every one of my images, I have an identifier. I want to load up uh, the radiology report that corresponds to this. Um, so I'm, I've, I've again prefabbed this. 
Um, but it's really, um, a lot of this is, is working in Pandas, um, which is a, a data science tool that's, that's fantastic. Um, and it gives you back these things called data frames, which is just you know a table. It, it has rows and columns like an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and it allows you to have um, things associated with each particular image. So here um, I have our DICOM ID. DICOM is a type of, uh, it's a medical image format. Um, and then I have a bunch of these labels um, representing uh, different conditions that are diagnosed on chest x-ray, atelectasis, um, cardiomegaly, uh, cardiomegaly is an enlarged heart. A, a lot of these other ones, edema, consolidation, atelectasis, they pertain to um, lung conditions. There's fracture. Um, so this is um, the uh, PA versus AP, as I mentioned, is the, the orientation of the person um, and the, the imaging equipment. Um, and finally over here, so I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, well, actually, it's probably easier to just look at the impression section. So the impression section is, again, our boiled down version of the radiology report. Um, and you can see, actually, one big, um, let me go ahead and make more. I'm just going to ask for more examples here. Um, OK, so you can see uh, this is a good example of um, one of the problems that we'll have with our data, which is that it's very um, templated. So uh, when, in, when a radiology report is normal, they'll often say something like normal study or no acute intrathoracic process, which means nothing's going on in the, in the chest and the, uh, no acute cardiopulmonary process. Nothing's going on with the heart and the lungs. Um, the other ones that are uh, for abnormals are going to be a lot, uh, a lot more involved. Um, and uh, we're going to, let's see if I can, um, uh, I have to do a little bit of, Oops. Okay, um, this is just to get a little bit wider view of each of them. Okay, so you can see there's a lot of, uh, a lot of text here. Um, and um, we're going to try to get our model to understand most of this text. Um, so um, uh, this is, not too interesting. Again, just, just setting up our frame a little bit. Um, I'm going to skip this part, skip this part. Um, okay. Um, so the first thing that we'll do is what I mentioned earlier, which is we can take our embeddings and we can train a very small model. So um, you can imagine, actually, let me go ahead. And, um, here's our GitHub, um, which uh, I will have links to, and um, you'll need to, if you want to use this tool, you'll need to s just fill out a very quick form, but um, it's just kind of getting to know who you are, um, not, nothing too heavyweight. Um, so if we look at our model here, okay. So um, the important part is actually here. So we're we're putting together just two of these layers that are called dense layers. So that's this line of those circles that I mentioned, those um, those neurons, um, and there's just two of them. Um, so that's that's it. That's how complicated our model is. Um, and with Keras, which is a library that um, works on top of TensorFlow, um, it's as simple as just saying, "Give me one layer, give me another layer, and then I put my model together." So the rest of this stuff is um, a little bit you don't need to know too much about it right now. Um, it has to do with things like your learning rate. Um, but I just wanted to point that out to show you how simple the model is. Um, okay, so now um, I'm going to start this training so that it will... Uh, uh oh. Oh. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start a training so that it can, it can run while uh, I'm talking. Um, so what I've done is I've given it, um, my labels, which are for the condition called cardiomegaly, and they're just one for positive, zero for negative. Um, these are just all of our, um, our hyperparameters. So batch size, how many, how many images are we going to look at at once? 512. 
how many epochs are we going to train? 20. We're going to, we're going to train, go through the whole data set 20 times. Um, so what's nice about this, you'll see the first uh, epoch, the first pass through all the data um, is going to be pretty slow. Um, but then I'm going to cache the data set and it will fly. Um, so as, you can, as it's training here, you can notice the, the training loss is going down, which is good. Um, the AUC, which is, is going up, it's getting up to 0.81. This is all for the training set. So what we, what we mostly care about is our validation set. We want to know um, how does this do on data that it hasn't seen yet. Um, so we'll leave that off for a minute. Um, I wanted to ask, David, are we able to go a little over time if I? I think we're OK. Folks, don't mind sticking around with us. Happy to finish up. Yeah, sorry. I. I underestimated how long this would um, this would go but I definitely I'm, I'm able to stick around so I, I if people have extra questions and so on absolutely we can leave some of the questions that were asked in the chat for the very end so folks can uh, join or leave as needed okay sounds good um, okay um, let's see uh, other things I wanted to call out here um, let me, oh wait, I don't have any. Uh, um, okay, so two, two of the things that I didn't, um, that I glossed over here were your learning rate and your optimizer. So these are the things, um, broadly speaking, when you're doing machine learning and, and it's doing back propagation, you're taking steps toward your, your end result. Um, and these just determine how big those steps are. Um, and the, the learning rate particular d defines how big that step is. You can do things like a learning rate function where it will um, get smaller over time so that you're taking smaller steps, sort of getting closer to your result. OK, here we go. Um, so a couple interesting things here before we move on. Um, you can notice that over each of the epochs, um, our, this is our training AUC. And it's getting much, much better, getting almost close to 1, which is the best possible result. Our training loss here is constantly decreasing, um, but our validation loss, so it starts off decreasing and then it basically plateaus. Um, it even starts to increase a little bit at the end. Um, and our AUC for the validation um, set stays about the same, but it's still good. It's 0.86. Um, so this is an example of overfitting. Um, when uh, your, your model, even one that's this small, but the embeddings being as um, feature rich as they are, it learns um, too well in some ways. Um, it's it's um, picking up on things that don't, don't translate well to other data sets. Um, so we call this overfitting. And there's a bunch of different ways to handle it. Uh, a lot of techniques are called regularization um, that try to address that. Um, and that's a lot of what we do as um, machine learning specialists. Um, so here we can just very quickly look at model.summary. We'll give you a quick uh, breakdown of the whole network. So again, it's very, very small. Um, it has two dense layers of 512 and 256 neurons. Um, and the total number of parameters is less than a million. So that's a pretty small network. Um, OK, so let's do some more interesting stuff. Um, so now, as I mentioned before, we often take one data set, we train on it, we validate on another, we, we test on another one to see how it's doing. So the MIMIC data, data set comes from uh, MIT, uh, I, I can't remember which hospital systems, um, but it's mostly um, ICU patients, so intensive care patients. Chexpert is a data set that comes from Stanford, so all the way across the country, different um, imaging equipment, different distribution of patients, um, so we're going to actually test our model on Chexpert without having trained on it at all. Um, we want to see how well it does when it hasn't seen the data yet. So I'm going to go ahead and load up our uh, train and our validation sets for Chexpert. Um, and this is another labels file that I've created. Um, you can see these numbers correspond to the, the various um, conditions cardiomegaly among them. Um, OK, so now I'm going to gloss over this a little bit because I need to start the training, and then we can come back. Um, uh, 
Okay. This is even messier than I remember. Um, okay, so uh, um, how are we going to feed our radiology report into the model? Um, well, we need to convert it to numbers just like we convert, like, just like the image is numbers. Um, so that's all that this, this stuff is doing here. Um, here, I'm just setting up a little bit of a, of a way for us to um, uh, use Chexpert as the evaluation set. Um, so now our model is a little bit, um, slightly more complicated, um, but it's not, not too much so. Um, so we have um, a couple layers here that are going to get added onto our image. And then those, a couple of different layers are gonna get added onto our text. And then we're gonna take the outputs of those two and compare them. Um, and that's going to be our task. Um, so here, in order to get, get numbers from our, our uh, radiology reports, um, we're going to pass them through this preprocessor. So we're going to tokenize them in the, the language of uh, natural language processing. Um, so basically that's going to, that's just a dictionary of, okay, this word is the number one, this word is the number two, and so on. In fact, they're actually word pieces, so they're, you know, syllables or, or a few, um, a, one part of the word. Um, and I'm, this is, this is all a bunch of fancy stuff that just says, okay, do that assignment. Um, now I mentioned the clip model. This is where the, the magic is happening. Um, I'm just going to, let's gloss over that part. Um, all this is doing is passing our image through one side of it, our text through another, and again, this um, loss function here uh, is a cosine similarity. Um, so it's going to say, how close are these together? Um, the farther apart they are, um, the more we want to bring them together, um, and that's what our loss function is going to be. Um, this is just another uh, learning rate. Function. So here's our data set in TensorFlow. You, um, you can uh, basically define your data set sort of um, iteratively um, where it reads in these, these files um, and then it processes them as, as you go. Um, and that will be a little bit faster than if you tried to load it all into memory. Um, okay, so let's look here. Um, I'm now initializing our model, um, our, our clip loss model. Um, I'm giving it a um, cosine decay, which is a type of learning rate. Um, I'm giving it the atom w optimizer. Um, and um, then I'm just calling model dot fit on it. Um, so each uh, iteration is actually going to go for about 500 steps. Um, then it's going to pause, you can see it's paused right now. Um, and it's going to evaluate on a uh, Val the validation set of Chexpert. So, but what's interesting here is that, um, and I maybe buried the lead a little bit here, but Chexpert, uh, we don't have the radiology reports for it. Um, so uh, we're, we have the radiology reports for Mimic and we're using that to train the model. So how do we get a result from Chexpert at the time of, of evaluating our model? Well, I glossed over this before, but let's go back here. Um, the way that we're defining our labels now for Chexpert is this so-called um, zero shot or like kind of a, a soft prompt, right? So we get to pick whatever we want to define our labels. Um, so uh, if you wanna search for a right pleural effusion or a left pleural effusion, you can do that instead of just a label of effusion or not. Um, you, can, you can specify moderate cardiomegaly, severe cardiomegaly. Um, and we're going to do a little bit of math to turn this into a prediction. So over here on the right, um, this set of, of um, prompts is going to say, okay, this is normal. So as I mentioned earlier, this sort of template of saying um, no acute cardiopulmonary process. That means you know, nothing, nothing is going on there. <clears throat> and uh, there's no pleural effusion. So we can get our prediction from this. Um, let's see how our training is going here. Okay, so we got our first result. Um, I'm actually gonna just halt it there since um, uh, in the interest of time. So you can see we're getting really good um, AUC scores, even though the model has not seen this data set or 
these exact phrases. Um, we're sort of asking a question of the model that hasn't been asked before. Um, and uh, one cool thing that we can now do with this, um, so what if we wanted to write a plain text chest x-ray search engine? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we have the ability to uh, query now our Chexpert data set where we don't have the radiology reports. Uh, what we do is we feed in our query, which is in natural language. We, we turn it into numbers, and then we ask the model, how similar is this to the image? Um, and when we do that, we can then rank them and say, here's the top five. Um, so I, I have a query here of large bilateral plural effusions. Um, and this is going to give me results that have some of those things. Um, <clears throat> and if we wanted to look for a, let's see. A normal chest x-ray, we can do that as well. So as you can see, these are a lot more normal. Um, so we just built a, a search engine for our chest x-rays. Um, you could imagine this would be useful if you were a radiologist and you wanted to look up an example of a case, but we didn't have radiology reports for it. Um, okay, so I am gonna have to hurry through this last one. So let's just get to it for my next trick. Uh, we're, we're gonna train a radiology report generator. Um, so this is not going to be perfect, but it's a it's a, just a pretty cool demonstration of what we have, what the possibilities are here. Um, so the setup is actually quite similar to our clip model, where we have a uh, text model over here on the side, in addition to our vision um, side of things. Um, this this in this case it's going to be what we call a an encoder decoder. The encoder is actually not used. The decoder is a BERT, um, which is a type of transformer, um, which uh, is used a lot in natural language processing, as I mentioned. Um, so we're basically going to give it, um, we're going to give it our image embedding. We feed that into our, uh, the text model, and then we say, give us some text uh, for this, uh, which is a, a crazy thing to do, to be honest. <laughs> to ask it to, uh, to do something like that. Um, so you can see it's gonna take a couple minutes to train, but thankfully I did prefab the results, I hope. One interesting thing to note here, um, I had to reduce the batch size considerably. It no longer fits in my GPU even, which is why it's also slower. Um, some of the things that you just sort of wrestle with as a, an ML practitioner. Um, and let's just say, this is my final trained model, I hope. Okay, so now I'm going to run through our validation data set and I'm gonna ask it to give me the radiology reports and I'm gonna compare that to what the actual ones are. Um, so to be honest, it's surprising even to me how well this works. Um, so here's a normal one, no acute intrathoracic process, no evidence of a pneumonia. Um, here's an example where it's not working, which is uh, it's always good to start looking at. So Dobhoff tube is, is one of a type of tube for, um, I think it's for feeding, a feeding tube. And you can see here, instead of Dobhoff, it says do something. So it doesn't quite know what to do with that. Um, same here, possible cavities, well, it says possible cat, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's getting there, um, and it's pretty crazy that it can do this with just our, um, our embeddings, um, and it gives you a sense of what you, what you could do with yours. Um, so I do, I want to quickly, before I wrap up, let's, okay. Um, so to read more about this and get more um, involved, uh, we did publish our paper in radiology. It's called Simplified Transfer Learning for Chest Radiography Models Using Less Data. Um, 
There's the free API, which I'll have links to um, where you can, and we'll have a collab where you can use some of these free data sets. Mimic and Check Checkspert, you can also work with, but for Mimic, you'll need to go through a training. For Checkspert, you, I think you, you, know, you need to sign some agreements, um, but they're also available to you. <clears throat> Our goal really is to accelerate research. Uh, we're always looking for collaborations. If you know people, if you are people that want to collaborate and build something cool with this, please reach out. Um, What's next? We want to do this for more modalities. We want to do it for um, potentially ultrasound uh, and, and some others that I think would benefit a lot from this. Um, I also have, <clears throat> excuse me, have some links here. Um, there's a software engineering internship. Um, applications are open now through December 1st for undergrad, graduate, PhD students. Um, there's some connect with Google resources. So this one references um, students and I think it's focused on the US but there also is a link um, and maybe I can break them out there's there's links in here for uh, around the world as well as industry so a few others that are maybe more specific to whatever um, group you identify with um, and some other uh, resources Google careers on air um, and yeah again all these will be will be linked for you so um, uh, I want to pause there. Uh, sorry, I went even longer than I expected, but um, I do want to uh, uh, stick around for questions. I, I'm able to stay around for um, 20, 25 minutes, um, depending on <clears throat> on how long people want, want to stay. But again, thank you so much. Um, I really hope this has inspired you, gotten you excited about it. Um, also giving you the confidence that this is something you can do and you shouldn't be um, overwhelmed by it or feel like um, it's beyond your reach, uh, you absolutely can do it. Uh, and CS50 will give you the tools to do it. So. Thank you, Andrew, so much for joining us. And maybe a virtual round of applause with your favorite emoji reaction or physical hands. So good to reunite. If I could ask just one question on behalf of the group and then turn things over to you and Carter so that I can get to another meeting myself, if you don't mind. But we'd love for folks to stick around for more one-on-one -on -one Q and A if you would like. Um, I think one question for the group that was recurring in the chat was just how folks can learn more, not just about these resources that you have on the screen, but if they want to learn more about AI, like you did on your own, if they want to learn more about AI in medicine, are there courses? Are there universities? Are there other learning resources you would recommend specifically? Yeah, I would definitely, as I said before, I would highly recommend CS50's AI for, uh, for AI, artificial intelligence in Python. The Coursera course is, is good too. I would be remiss to not mention that. Machine learning was the original Coursera course. Um, O'Reilly has great books. I always, get, when I'm trying to learn something new, I always go for O'Reilly first. Um, those are the ones with the the funny images of, of animals on the front. Um, those are usually a good, good, um, and honestly, YouTube, um, you know, there's just so much content these days of people walking you through things, um, getting you um, bootstrapped and those things. Um, but maybe I can come, come up with like a list of, of resources too, and we can post that with the rest of, with the rest of these slides and so on, David, that would, that would probably be good. Absolutely. I've been sharing the slides in the chat and we will post everything at cs50.ly slash zoom as well for folks afterward.